Chapter Eighteen, Part Two of An Antarctic Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Antarctic Mystery by Jules Verne, Chapter Eighteen, Part Two, A Revelation. Nothing important occurred on the thirteenth and fourteenth, but a fresh fall in the temperature took place. Captain Len Guy called my attention to this, pointing out the flocks of birds continuously flying north. While he was speaking to me, I felt that his last hopes were fading, and who could wonder? Of the land indicated by the half breed, nothing was seen, and we were already more than one hundred and eighty miles past Solal Island. At every point of the compass was the sea. Nothing but the vast sea with its desert horizon, which the sun's disk had been nearing since the twenty first, and would touch on the twenty first March, prior to during the six months of the austral night. Honestly, was it possible to admit that William Guy and his five companions could have accomplished such a distance on a craft, and was there one chance in a hundred that they could ever be recovered? On the 15th of January, an observation most carefully taken gave 43 degrees 13 minutes longitude and 88 degrees 17 minutes latitude. The Halbrane was less than two degrees from the pole. Captain Len Guy did not seek to conceal the result of this observation, and the sailors knew enough of nautical calculation to understand it. Besides, if the consequences had to be explained to them, were not Holt and Hardy there to do this, and Hearn to exaggerate them to the utmost? During the afternoon I had indubitable proof that the sealing-master had been working on the minds of the crew. The men emerging at the foot of the mainmast talked in whispers and cast evil glances at us. Two or three sailors made threatening gestures undisguisedly. Then arose such angry mutterings that West could not be deaf to them. He strode forward and called out, "'Silence there! The first man who speaks will have to reckon with me!' Captain Len Guy was shut up in his cabin, but every moment I expected to see him come out, give one last long look around the wastes of waters, and then order the ship's course to be reversed. Nevertheless, on the next day the schooner was sailing in the same direction, unfortunately, for the circumstances had come some gravity. A mist was beginning to come down on us. I could not keep still. My apprehensions were redoubled. It was that West was only awaiting the order to change the helm. What mortal anguish the captain's must be! I understood too well that he would not give that order without hesitation. For several days past I had not seen the half-breed, or at least I had not exchanged a word with him. He was boycotted by the whole crew, with the exception of the boatswain, who was careful to address him, although rarely got a word in return. Dirk Peters took not the faintest notice of this state of things. He remained completely absorbed in his own thoughts. Yet, had he heard West give the word to steer north, I know not what acts of violence he might have been driven to. He seemed to avoid me. Was this from a desire not to compromise me? On the seventeenth in the afternoon, however, Dirk Peters manifested an intention of speaking to me, and never, never could I have imagined what I was to learn in that interview. It was about half-past two, and, not feeling well, I had gone to my cabin, where the side window was open, that at the back was closed. I heard a knock at the door, and asked who was there. "'Dirk Peters,' was the reply. "'You want to speak to me?' "'Yes. I'm coming out. If you please, I sh should prefer. May I come into your cabin?' "'Come in.' He entered and shut the door behind him. Without rising, I signed to him to seat himself in an armchair, but he remained standing. "'What do you want of me, Dirk Peters?' I asked at length, as he seemed unable to make up his mind to speak. "'I want to tell you something, because it seems that you should know it, and you only in the crew they must never know it. "'If it is a grave matter, and you fear any indiscretion, Dirk Peters, why do you speak to me?' If I must, ah, yes, I must. It is impossible to keep it there. It weighs on me like a stone. And Dirk Peters struck his breast violently. Then he resumed. Yes, I, I am always afraid it may escape me during my sleep. 
and that someone will hear it, for I dream of it, and in dreaming. You dream, I replied, and of what? Of him, of him. Therefore it is that I sleep in corners, all alone, for fear that his true name should be discovered. Then it struck me that the half-breed was perhaps about to respond to an inquiry which I had not yet made. Why he had gone to live at the Falklands under the name of Hunt after leaving Illinois. I put the question to him, and he replied, It is not that, no, it is not that I wish. I insist, Dirk Peters, and I desire to know in the first place for what reason did you not remain in America, for what reason you chose the Falklands. For what reason, sir? Because I wanted to get near Pym, my poor Pym, because I hoped to find an opportunity at the Falklands of embarking on a whaling ship bound for the southern sea. But that name of Hunt? I would not bear my own name any longer, on account of the affair of the Grampus. The half-breed was alluding to the scene of the short straw, or lot-drawing on board the American brig, when it was decided between Augustus Bernard, Arthur Pym, Jerk Peters, and Parker the sailor, that one of the four should be sacrificed, as food for the three others. I remembered the obstinate resistance of Arthur Pym, and how it was impossible for him to refuse to take the tragedy about to be performed. He says this himself, and the horrible act, whose remembrance must poison the existence of all those who had survived it. Oh, that lot drawing, the short straws, were little splinters of wood of uneven length which Arthur held in his hand. The shortest was to designate him who should be immolated. And he speaks of the sort of involuntary, fierce desire to deceive his corn that he felt to cheat is the word he uses. But he did not cheat, and he asked pardon for having had the idea. Let us try to put ourselves in his place. He made up his mind and held out his hand, closed on the four slips. Dirk Peters drew the first. Fate favoured him. He had nothing more to fear. Arthur Pym calculated the one more chance was against him. Augustus Bernard drew in turn. Save two he. And now Arthur Pym reckoned up the exact chances Parker and himself. At that moment all the ferocity, the tiger entered into his soul. He conceived an intense and devilish hatred of his poor comrade, his fellow man. Five minutes elapsed before Parker dared to draw. At length Arthur Pym, standing with eyes closed, not knowing whether the lot was for or against him, felt a hand seize his own. It was the hand of Dirk Peters. Arthur Pym had escaped death. And then the half-breed came upon Parker and stabbed him in the back. The frightful repast followed immediately, and words are not sufficient to convey to the mind the horror of the reality. Yes, I knew that hideous story, not a fable, as I had long believed. This was what had happened on board the Grampus on the 16th of July, 1827, and vainly did I try to understand Dirk Peters' reason for recalling it to my recollection. Well, Dirk Peters, I said, I will ask you, since you were anxious to hide your name, what it was that induced you to reveal it when the Halbrane was moored off Salal Island. Why did you not keep to the name of Hunt? Sir, understand me. There was hesitation about going further. They wanted to turn back. This was decided, and then I thought that by telling you who I was, Dirk Peters, of the Grampus, my poor Pym's companion, I should be heard. They would believe with me that he was still living. They would go in search of him. And yet it was a serious thing to do, to acknowledge that I was Dirk Peters, he who had killed Parker but hunger, devouring hunger. Come, come, Dirk Peters, said I. You exaggerate. If the lot had fallen to you, you would have incurred the fate of Parker. You cannot be charged with a crime. Sir, would Parker's family speak of it as you do? His family? Had he then relations? Yes, and that is why Pym changed his name in the narrative. Parker's name was not Parker, it was... Arthur Pym was right. I said, interrupting him quickly, and as for me, I do not wish to know Parker's real name. Keep this secret. No, I will tell it to you. It weighs too heavily on me, and I shall be relieved, perhaps, when I have told you, Mr. Jorling. No, Dirk Peters, no. His name was Holt, Ned Holt. Holt, I exclaimed. 
The same name as our sailing masters? Who is his own brother, sir? Martin Holt? Yes, understand me, his brother. But he believes that Ned Holt perished in the wreck of the Grampus with the rest. It was not so, and if he learned that I... Just at that instant, a violent shock flung me out of my bunk. The schooner had made such a lurch to the port side that she was near foundering. I heard an angry voice cry out, "'What dog is at the helm?' It was the voice of West, and the person was Hearn. I rushed out of my cabin. "'Have you let the wheel go?' repeated West, who had seized Hearn by the collar of his jersey. "'Lieutenant, I don't know. Yes, I tell you, you have let it go a little more, and the schooner would have capsized under full sail.' Gratian cried West, calling one of the sailors. "'Take the helm, and you, Hearn, go down into the hold.' On a sudden the cry of land resounded, and every eye was turned southward. End of chapter 18, part 2